All right, everybody, we've been talking about this. It's a retrospective on the ballad of Gregorio Cortez. My name is Polly. I'm here with Undoomed, Loki, and Mr. Edward James Olmos. Hey, <laughs> sir, thank sir, you. first of all, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. It's my honor and my privilege. Thank you, Polly. It really is. Loki, great. Um, so uh, let's. Uh, let, let, I know you're busy, so let, let's get right into this. I think Undoomed has a question. All right. Uh, first of all, Mr. Olmos, uh, I'd like to say thank you for your amazing work. Certainly helped me out during some dark times, and especially Battlestar Galactica. Um, I would like to ask you a little bit about uh, the Ballad of Gregor, uh, Gregorio Cortez, uh, which I thought thought was an excellent western. I'm I'm fascinated by the music. It has sort of a John Carpenter style synth score integrated, and I love that. And I noticed you have writing credits for the music along with another person. So I would just like to ask you who did what and how did you come to integrate uh, this sort of John Carpenter style synth score into a Western? Because I thought that was a brilliant and unique choice. Well, actually, it was during the era, 19, it was 1981. And uh, we had no money. So my friend, Michael Lewis, uh, was a dear close friend of mine who had a synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Herth Martinez, who is a good friend of mine uh, from since we were like three years old, four years old, who's a brilliant guitar player, may he rest in peace. He's passed away since this was, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. But um, anyway. It was just Hearth, myself, and uh, Michael. And Michael and I did the writing on, on the music. And uh, it was pretty improvisational. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and it was uh, really geared more towards uh, uh, Chariots of Fire. Remember Chariots of Fire? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that sound school done by, I guess, was John Hammer, I think it was. Um, that, uh, to me, was uh, very inspirational. And yet was, uh, uh, it was an old, the, the, they were in the 30s, I guess, during the Second World War, right before the Second World War, that movie takes place. And, and, it, and it worked. And I said, you know what, let's, let's go synth all the way, man, instead of trying to, you know, find <laughs> musicians to come and help us and do that whole thing. I said, I got a great guitar player, so and I called Hertz, and I said, Hertz, can you help me? And I had a wonderful friend, David Anderley, who has passed away also, but uh, he used to be the head, head he's the head a and Records, and he was uh, a really a great producer. He produced some great music, and we produced together in the 60s. And I had been playing music since 1960, and, and I played a little keyboard, played a little bit of guitar, and I used to sing and write, and, and so uh, I was into music. And so in 1981, so Michael Lewis and myself, uh, got together and we started the scoring of the movie and it just locked in and we used the ballad and of course the original ballad done by uh, uh, Dr. Américo Paredes who wrote the book with a pistol in his hand uh, where the was the original understanding of the corrido and and uh, that was his uh, doctoral thesis and uh, so he he wrote a little book and the book was mainly about I'd say 30%, 30 pages out of the whole book of maybe 180 pages, 170 pages, was about the man. The rest of it was about the corrido and what it meant to uh, the culture and how it was formed and where it came from and how the corridos were so important to our culture, the, the Latin culture, but especially the Mexican culture along the border. And so uh, that being said, we had, uh, I asked if we could use his rendition of it. So that's the one you hit the very beginning of the movie. And at the end of the movie, it's uh, his uh, rendition. And then we got into it and started, you know, doing using the chord changes and using the, the situation to to some melodies from there and started to augment them and use them throughout the piece itself and connected it with the uh, uh, driving sound of, of uh, synthesized uh, sound. And uh, to me, it works real well. And to this day, uh, it even works better because now um, th this movie is quite unusual, to be honest with you guys. Um, it's in the uh, registry, National Registry of Film, 
and uh, they just mm -hmm. accepted Selena. And I got that, that information a, a month ago. And um, but right now the ballad is in there, and uh, it is been hailed by the United States Historical Society, which really controls all of the uh, the, the facts of, of uh, our history as uh, as a people in the United States of America. The United States Historical Society proclaimed it to be this movie proclaimed it to be the most authentic Western ever made, and they said that. It's the only dramatic piece of film, or else fictional film, it's a dra drama, um, that uh, they would consider to be documentive fact. And uh, they didn't even do it for Reds. Warren Beatty wanted to have Reds uh, as a, uh, have this kind of uh, accolade, mm -hmm. this kind of uh, understanding that it was so well constructed and so well understood that it was actually documentation of, of the things that went on during that period of time during the, the uh, Russian Revolution. And, uh, but in our case, we didn't ask for it. We got the, the call telling us that they had uh, seen a movie and that they considered it to be the most authentic Western ever made in the history of film. To this day, it still holds that uh, you know, accolade. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. very proud of that film. I think it's, to me, it's uh, the best usage of film. And I've done some, <laughs> to stand and deliver American me, you know, mi familia, Selena, you, you know, walk out, you name it. And, and uh, we've done a lot of work on film. And, uh, but I think that the ballad of Gregory Cortez is truly one of a kind and uh, it does merit that understanding. And uh, not that uh, the other, look at Selena's fantastic. American me is very powerful, very strong. It's stand and deliver is one of the most viewed films ever viewed and ever used in the history of film. More people have seen that one than almost any film ever made because of the fact that they use it every, every year. Tens of thousands of teachers use it in their classroom to motivate and inspire the students. And uh, that's been going on for almost 40 years. And uh, so basically, uh, the ballad to me is the finest film, the usage of film I've ever done in my life. And so, You've picked uh, uh, a time and a place for us here in 2022. And you guys, uh, you know, the Latino slant is uh, definitely on time to well, bring to light something that, that, to me, you bring into light to a lot of people who have never even seen it. You know, it's been in 98. Yeah. Correct. Especially in Edward James Olmos uh, uh, film on Doom, they'll think Battlestar Galactica first or yes. stand and deliver, especially from our community. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this, in this film, I, I, I just saw it again. Criterion, great job. Yeah. God, it's so, it's really emotional. It's really, you know, but yeah, besides but everything was... you just said, Mr. Almost, it's incredibly emotional. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's deep. It's, it's a deep story. And it's, you know, uh, just how, how you guys were, were telling. But, um, uh, Loki had funny that you said that about Stand Deliver because Loki's got a great question for you. About um, 30 years ago, my father retired from the U.S. Navy. He was a pilot. He was a uh, S3A Viking pilot. He flew jets off of carriers. And he decided to retire after 20 years. And he sat us all down and said, um, I'm going to go back to college and I'm going to become a teacher. And I didn't understand at first. I said, how could you, how can you go from, from flying jets off of aircraft carriers to being a teacher? And a couple of days later, I asked him that question and we sat down that night and we watched Stand and Deliver. It was the very first time I'd seen that. You are the reason why I know how to multiply by nine so easily as well, sir. Um, but did you man. ever, <laughs> yeah, the finger <laughs> man, are you the finger man? I'm the finger man. I can times by, I'm multiplied by nine. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite part in the entire movie. But um, did you ever imagine that through film, through your art, through your craft, that you would inspire so many people? He played that movie. Like you said, he played that movie every year for his kids. He played that movie every year for 15 years while he was teaching for his kids. Did you ever imagine you would inspire someone like that? No, because uh, emotionally, I say that because I'm crying right now. It's, uh, 
it's an understanding. Um, we are born to die in between. You got to fill it with happiness. That's the only thing life asks of you. Just be happy. And it's hard. It's hard to be happy. There's just so much of life that gets in the way. And we allow it to get in the way. And all of a sudden, something happens. And there's a moment in time when it's like what they say, catching lightning in a bottle. It, you, it's impossible. And yet, here you go. We did it. And that movie is one of a kind, just like the ballad, Stand and Delivery is one of a kind. And, and believe me when I tell you, that film has inspired, motivated, not only the students, but the teacher. I can't imagine being a teacher and playing that song, that uh, uh, movie for my students before the, the school year starts, you know, and, and play it for them or through the school year sometime and they play it for them and then have to get in front of that group of kids and teach them after they see what this teacher could do and did and how he did it and how he motivated and how he inspired them and how he became uh, not only a teacher, he became a life force of understanding for them. Because you know, mathematics is a language. It's like French or German or you know, Polish. It's, it's just Japanese or Chinese. It's very, very, you know, it's, it's good for us in understanding. It's, uh, you know, critical thinking is the most important aspect, one of the most important aspects of the brain. And it, it enhances us as human beings to the fullest. It gets the best usage of our mind going. That and music are connected even. But uh, this guy, Jaime Escalante, inspired teachers all over the world, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And uh, we did that movie. And when we're doing it, we did it for like 1.2 million. Matter of fact, that was the same budget that we did for the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. And that had like uh, 1,500, uh, it had 150 horses, 5,000 wardrobe changes. We went to three states of the Union, so New Mexico, Colorado, and Texas. We had period cars, period trains, and we did it for 1.2 million. And uh, that's really inexpensive. Uh, even then in 1981. This was done in 1988, the ballot and the stand and deliver, and that was 1.2 million also. And uh, we, you know, that we did it in, in 24 days. Um, and it was wonderfully done. And uh, again, the beauty of, of stand and deliver is the story, Loki. The story is what grabs you. And then of course, we brought it to light because everybody rose to the level of expectation and you couldn't do anything less than that. That's part of the movie. And that's, Jaime Escalante was at my side every minute of every shot that I ever did for that movie. He was there and he would be standing like this and be watching, <laughs> and then I'd finish the scene and he'd go, <laughs> you know, really too much. And I knew that if he gave me the thumbs up, that I had done it well, and we could go yeah. on, you know. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, it, it was a blessing, and, and your father is a blessing. Uh, what an inspiration that movie has been to not only your dad, but to, to a lot of teachers have come up to me and said, I saw your movie stand and deliver when I was a kid, and I wanted to be a teacher. And I want to thank you for that movie. And I go, thank you for your life. You have literally crossed. He crossed. I mean, at one point, you know, your father was a brilliant, he, he, look, he had to be an engineer in order to be a fighter pilot and landing on aircraft carriers. You got to be really together. You have to understand math, high, high intent. And you have to understand all there is to be a lieutenant, you know, colonel to fly these jets and land them. And uh, so for him to decide, like you said, to go back to school and get his education degree so he can turn around and teach after he retired from being an Air Force pilot or Naval pilot, pilot, you know, it's like amazing. So yeah, Loki, I gotta tell you, that movie inspired your father and it's inspired many kids all over this world and especially in this country and especially Latinos. Oh man, it's like, it's like a glass of water in the desert. That's all I can tell you. 
you have inspired you have inspired people as well, just like Hani Escalante. Well, yeah, I, I performed the piece. I, I I made that character come to life, Loki. But I, if imitation is the highest form of flattery, I imitated that man to the finest ever. That was not me. That was me seeing him, the way he worked, and then me taking that and doing it exactly as I saw him. And my expertise is duplicating human behavior. And I can do it. I can do my own sense of what it is, or I can see somebody else do it and I can duplicate it. And, and uh, you know, bringing truth to the moment to moment inside of a performance. But the real deal, that guy did it. I mean, that was truth at the highest level, just like the ballad of Gregory Cortez. That was truth to the highest level. And that's why it's so sad. And the more, the older it gets, the better it gets. Both movies, both films are better now than they were the day we finished them. One in 1987, we finished Stand and Deliver. And uh, 1981, we finished uh, The Ballad, but it didn't come out till 1983. And, and uh, Stand and Deliver came out in 1988. Uh, Mr. Olmos, in regards to Gregory Cortez, you know, there's other quote unquote banditos of that before him, all including him, which inspired Zorro and uh, the Batman, Batman, Joaquin Murrieta, Vasquez. Um, would you like to see some of those other, uh, you know, uh, heroes or, you know, uh, legends? On the on the big screen, I mean, they're part of California history, part of a United States history. What's your, what's oh, your you, feeling you, on that? You you uh, must be channeling a great understanding of what's coming. Uh, yeah, we're in the processes right now of doing Joaquin Murrieta. Oh, and really? I'll be directing it. Yeah. And wait, uh, wait, you're you're probably directing that? Did yeah. Did you just? Wow. Wow. <laughs> A very, very, very undoing. It is an amazing journey we're about to take. And it's not that it's a big explosive story. It's just, it's where Zorro comes from. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The Zorro came from, from uh, Joaquin Murrieta and, and uh, Vasquez, Tiburcio Vasquez. And those two characters make up this, the legendary Zorro because the, the guy who wrote Zorro back in the 19th, beginning of the 19th, 20th century. 19, yeah, 1919. 19 what? 1919, uh, The Curse of Capistrano. It, it's when Zorro the, the, was written? That's when it came out, was 1919 or 1920. It was, it was published. Yeah, 1919. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, you got it. I thought it was early in 1906, 1907, but it's cool. 1919. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm trying to add up. It was up there. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, Basically, uh, the story of Joaquin Murrieta is going to be something that will be very, people will be very happy that we did it. And uh, we're going to do it with the same flavor that we've got in the ballet, or, or Cortez, with the same aesthetic. And, nice. Uh, yeah, it won't be a blockbuster at the beginning, but hopefully, because it'll be streaming. So I think people will start to learn about it and get to, get to see it. Millions of people will see it because it'll be streaming on one of the streamers, I don't know which one we're going to use yet, but, and I, I that, have no idea when I ask this question. I know, I know you, <laughs> you, you, you went, you're hopefully wishing that we would make more movies like that. I, I've been trying to do the Vasquez for since 1979, when I did Bandido for Luis Valdez up in, in, in uh, Teatro Campesino, I created the Vasquez on stage. First, oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. I thought that then, was uh, A. Martinez. A. Martinez. A. Martinez did it on, at the uh, uh, um, PBS or something. No, he did it. In, well, they eventually did it on PBS. Right, right, right. Originally on stage at the Mark Taper. I created the role at the uh, um, at the Teatro Campesino. In San Cor Martinez. Gotcha. Gotcha. And after I created it, I went off and I was doing other work and then he got A. Martinez to play him on, on the stage and then they went on to complete and do the rest of it again. But um, this is uh, this Joaquin Murrieta is a little different. Um, this is a sad, tragic story and a true story. And uh, he's a true bandido. The ba with Gregor Cortez, he wasn't a bandido. Right. They Cortez was, was mistaken. Was Correct. Correct. They said he was a gang guy, but... 
real quick, they found out that, uh, not real quick, but after 600 Mexicans were killed by the Texas Rangers in a matter of a few weeks. Okay, that's, that's a real tragic. You know, we didn't emphasize that understanding. We just knew that, we showed that they were just killing randomly. Yeah. Mexicans, every Yeah, you know that was not, them? yeah, that was, they, yeah. I'm sorry, the storytelling was, was, was done very well. I think if that was made today, I think it would have been, it would have been like just a little hammered too much, heavy handed. Maybe, um, you know, it depends um, on who's making it. That's true, sir. You're absolutely right. Um, but either way, it did happen. <laughs> yeah, it did. It's a true story. And, and uh, with, you know, stand and deliver and Selena. Right. American me. You know, if, you have, if you have a couple of more minutes, we'd love to ask a couple more questions. Here, if that's OK with you. Um, in uh, Undoomed, I think, has uh, has another one. For sure. You. Sure. Um, so, Mr. Olmos, um, I understand that uh, you came up with city speaker gutter talk in Blade Runner uh, that your character Gaff uses. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you go about creating a believable language like that? Did you just go out and buy a bunch of dictionaries or okay. did you employ a linguist or how, does, how did that work? The year was 1980 and uh, when they asked me to come in and talk with uh, Ridley Scott and, uh, you know, I had just done, I did uh, Zutsu in 1978, mm -hmm. February 14th of 1978, we opened on the Temper, Taper, Mark Taper stage in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a, immediately an overwhelming success. And just like people were unbelievably moved by the piece. And my mm -hmm. character especially came to light. El Pachuco became, now it's an integral part of our culture. And, uh, and the pachucos from, you know, the Armenian pachuco came out and the Italian pachuco came out and, and you know, they used to, each, each culture had their pachuco. And right. pachismo was an attitude. It was, it was that they wore their pride, their, their, their self-esteem, their self-respect as a shield in front of them. So right. that, you know, they, 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 you couldn't see anything other than that which is nothing wrong with that, except that, you know, life is much more getting to know somebody by understanding how they're, the vulnerabilities and who they are as people and how much they give and take. And, and with the Pachuco, uh -uh. <laughs> you can get deeper than what you see. And if you want to, you look at me, you better be understanding that, why are you looking at me? The question mm -hmm. goes right back to the person that was looking at them. So what are you looking at? Huh? What is it? Is it? And right at your conflict, <laughs> you're in conflict immediately. And so anyway, the, I had done Pachuco and uh, I got asked to do an indigenous uh, Mohawk Indian, First Nation person. And uh, I turned it down at first and I uh, told the director, he actually came to me when I was doing uh, Zutsu. He says, I got this movie that I really need you for. And it's called Wolfen. And I said, listen, man, you want me to play a Mohawk Indian? The script is superb. Everything's wonderful. Go out and find yourself a Native American. You know, go find, no, I said, go out and find yourself a Mohawk, a real one. Go to New York, find yourself a Mohawk and, and bring him in and, and give him the job. And I said, and if you don't do, if you don't find him, if you can't find an indigenous person, come back to me, but we're gonna go to the American Indian movement, AIM. We're gonna go to AIM and all the chiefs of all the nations in the United States are part of AIM. And uh, I, I want you to uh, uh, get a meeting with them and I wanna go in front of them and I want them to sanction me to do this role for them. Because I'm I'm mm. an Indian. I'm an Indian. I mean, I'm a Native American to the. I'm a Native. I'm a First Nation. I'm a, I'm a Yaki, uh, 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 Maya Mexica, <laughs> you know, Azteca right. a person. You know, I come from all of that indigenousness is in me, and I've been here for forty thousand years, man. So yes, I have uh, European roots. Yes, I do, and that's the only way you become Mexican. You get European and Native. Americans and, and the native uh, and First Nation people and they combined together and they created the Mexican. That's what the Mexican. Right. Okay. Es una mezclada. 
So that being said, uh, you know, they, I did, went ahead and I, and I, and they finally got me clearance and I went ahead and did that role. Well, Ridley heard about it and Ridley calls me up and says, Hey man, you know, what the hell are you doing? Work with me. And I said, Oh, really? You know, it'd be an honor. Cause I'd seen his duelist. I'd seen other movies. He, he had done uh, two movies by that time. And the Blade Runner was in the next one. He was a brilliant um, production designer. That's really mm -hmm. what his forte was. He was, he was a great director because he had directed many uh, television commercials, but his real true gift was in, and was in production value. And you could see it in every movie he made. Right. And so that being said, he asked me and I said, you know, I, I would like to do this film with you. And I said, I really would. Because it was a small role. It, it was, it was a, and I walk in, I go find Decker. I take him to go see the captain. I take him around to look for the guys. And then I'm, you know, I'm gone till the end of the movie. And it really was like a glor glorified, uh, you know, walkthrough. And uh, there was no depth to the character. And I said, I'll do this for you, but I want to do something. If you, if you want me to do this, I'll, I'll only do it on one condition. I, I want to speak uh, 10 languages. I want to be a multicultural person. So that in mm -hmm. 2019, you know, this was 1980, and we're talking 2019, that's 40 years. And I said, in 40 years, LA is going to look like this. It's going to be like, a, it's going to be, uh, Asian, Latino, uh, African, you know, Caucasian, and, and languages up the gazoo, indigenous, you know, everything's going to be here. And, and all of the cultures are going to be like mixed together. And mm -hmm. uh, a police officer goes and, and they, there's a robbery and say in Beverly Hills, and the guys take off and they go into the uh, Asian uh, Koreatown. Um, you're going to have, the, the police officers are going to have to be pretty in tune with how to go ask questions about uh, people that are in that, looking for the robbers in Koreatown. And, and then the, they went from the Korea, went from Koreatown to the African American section, South Central. And then from South Central, they went to East LA. And then from East LA, they went to the German sector. And so, or the Armenian sector, I said. And so the cop has to be able to communicate with the street people. So my mm -hmm. cop in 2019 is going to speak like 10 languages. And he goes, well, what does it sound like? I said, well, it sounds like, hello, cabrón. He looks at me, he looked at me and said, what was that? I said, I don't know. There's a bunch of sound tones right now. I said, I have to go and learn what I'm talking about. You know, I have to learn it, but I'm going to call it city speak. And it's going to be real dialogue. And your dialogue that you have there, me saying, but I'm going to say it like uh, two words in Japanese, three words in, in Armenian, two words in Italian, one word in French, and, and ending in Spanish. And I mm -hmm. said, holy shit. I said, yeah, you know, just subtitle it if you want to know. It doesn't really fucking matter. I mean, it doesn't matter at all. You know, the, my character is not driving the plot. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm a character development character that helps you understand the lead character. Now, and of course, you know, they put that over, they overdubbed a voice saying, you know, narrative talking about, you know, city speak and everybody spoke it. Bullshit. He didn't speak it. Nobody spoke it. I was the only guy that could speak that language <laughs> <laughs> to this day. There's a few, I've run into uh, uh, quite a few people since I did that role over the last 40 years that actually speak seven languages, six, seven languages. And they said, you know, it was an interesting idea that what you did because it worked, you know? And, and I know that there's some groups of people just adore me because I, I, I used their language, you know, in the movie. And so when they heard it in their part of the world, like what, the Hungarians love me. Right. When I use the Hungarian words that I use for them, they just adore me and they just think, wow, oh my God, that's fantastic. But. So yeah, I created that Undoomed. I, I created it and uh, it was, a, I was grateful for one thing. I was mm -hmm. grateful that Ridley Scott was secure enough within himself to allow growth around him. Very, very, very interesting understanding that I got from that man. When I worked with him and I'd worked with another man, that's where I got it from, 
1977, uh, Robert Young, I did the, the I did Alambrista, and that was being able to work with him. I learned how before I did Zutsu, I learned how to to speak and not be a threat to the powers that be by asking a question or giving a suggestion and not mm -hmm. being, hey, you know, just do what's on the page, man. And, you know, don't ask any questions. And, uh, you know, cause that's how they usually treat you. Right. You know, everybody just do what's on the page, you know, let's go. And, uh, you know, don't, don't ask, you know, I, I ain't got the time to, to, to discuss this with you. Cause you're, you know, you're a day player and you got one line. So mm, stop right. asking questions. <laughs> sure. I, was, I was always saying, well, I mean, it's not that I'm asking questions to, to take up your time. I'm asking questions because I really need to learn and understand why you're putting the camera here. And boy, they get upset with me. So boy, that time. Anyway, with Ridley, he was so secure that he allowed growth around him. And that's how I learned how to be a good leader. I learned, I learned that. I learned that from them and, and from Bob Young and from Ridley Scott and I, the rest is history. I, I learned to listen. And right. not that I didn't have my own sense of balance and I'm, I'm producing, I write, I produce, I, I direct, I act, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I understand the medium and, uh, and I was producing and, 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 and directing and, and doing theater and I was choreographer and I did musicals and I wrote the music for them. And so I was pretty well versed in the usage of the art form to storytelling in both theater and television and motion picture. So even though I didn't have a lot of experience, like seeing a television show, and they got me for one day's work and I would take it. Uh, it and so I would go there and I'd ask a question and that's when I get in trouble. But with, with, uh, with Zoot Suit, everything changed. When I did El Pachuco, what changed was the respect that the industry and the people who were talking to me had for what I had created. Right. So therefore, I never had to audition for a role again after I did wow. They really right. come to me and ask me, hey, can you help us do this? That's amazing. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a very high honor in this industry not to have to audition for a part. Yeah. Well, you you, des you deserve it, sir. Uh, you have time for one more quick question? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Loki. You um, very rarely today do you have a remake that lives up to the original product that came out. You walked on the set of Battlestar Galactica and um, took took the original spot of a man named Lauren Green, who did a great job as, as Adama, but you came in, sir, and you said, I'm going to I'm going to turn around and I'm going to hit the bully as hard as I can in the nose and make him think <laughs> twice about coming after me again. And Eddie, you are Adama. You are you are Bill Adama. There's absolutely no question. Did you know when when they were like, OK, we're going to do this miniseries? It might lead to something. Did you have any idea when you walked on the set of Battlestar Galactica that you would you would be changing sci-fi forever because of your role as Bill Adama. No, the uh, Battlestar Galactica to me has become uh, a centerpiece to the future of humanity. Mm. Because if you've seen it, you'll be able to handle nuclear holocaust. Because you know under any circumstances, whether you lose every single person you know, whether you've lost your every single human being that you know, and there's only a few people left on the planet, you're going to have to keep going. You have to sustain and move forward and, and right. find your way. You're not, you know, because if you hadn't seen Battlestar, you'll want to commit suicide. You won't want to live inside of the story. Right. Well, Mr. Olmos, um, uh, you know, thank you for all your time. I, I do have one final question back to the ballad of Gregory Cortez. Sure. He didn't do any subtitles no. and I understood and I really appreciate I, I, I appreciated now as an older adult because I hadn't seen it in, in, in a long time and as, as an older adult I was like ah oh, this is beautiful the way they're talking to each other the way the Spanish is is interwoven and you know and and so I so you know but I'm I'm Chicano like it's different for me why didn't there why wasn't there subtitles 
And I know Loki and Undoom, they they got the gist of what was going on, but I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Well, the gist is what was needed. You didn't have to understand everything, just like what happened to Gregorio Cortez until you see the story, you don't realize that it's a misunderstanding of one word that causes the largest manhunt in the history of Texas up to that point in time. It was 1901 and uh, there was nothing like it. They were using telephones, they were using the railroads, they were using modern technology. Uh, and uh, these people who didn't speak Spanish were placed in the same position as our characters who didn't speak Spanish. And so they had to see the end of the story in order to really understand the full meaning of the movie. So when they get to the end and they see, uh, you know, uh, Carlota comes into my, you know, played by Rosanna de Soto, she, she comes in and, and she translates to him and says, you know, he, he wants to know if that's the reason that his brother's dead. And then the guy says, yeah, just tell him, yeah, they misunderstood. The difference between Yewa, Yewa, and, Yewa. and uh, she, then she says in Spanish, "Yeah, well, he died because they didn't understand the difference between Yewa and Caballo, and uh, kills Cortez, killed him. I mean, it just like that reality is, and everybody at that moment knows and understands the story, and that way, you know, you that knew both languages knew all along what the, tr the trouble was." And so bilingual people were way ahead of the ball game from the beginning. They, they understood exactly what was going on. And it was sad because you're, you wrote it a different way than the people who were monolinguistic, whether they just all Spanish or all English. Because mm. you people yeah. saw the movie in Spanish, they only knew Spanish, uh, saw it that way. And they understood you know, the little that they got. But uh, then when they got to that point of understanding in, in the, inside the cell, you know, what Gregorio Cortez understood, um, it's mind boggling. It was so sad. I mean, come on, they killed six, over 600 Mexicans. <laughs> Jesus, come on, they thought we were chasing a gang. You know, it was one person, one guy on horseback, you know, right. he was such a good horseman. And, and boy, how do you like that scene where the horse lays down so I can, Take you know, she was like, Yeah, well, it was just beautiful, she was great. But we didn't know that the horse was going to lay down, no one trained the horse to lay down, really. Yeah, I just walked up, and and as I was walking forward, I'd been around horses before I saw her pawing the dirt, and I said, Oh, shit, this horse is going to lay down in the dirt. Wow, and so I'm taking the saddle off, and I'm thinking, like, Oh, come on, can we do it? I took off the bridle, and as I took off the bridle, the horse went down. I said, Oh, yes, oh, come on. Hold it right there, honey. And I'm talking to my to myself. And I walked up and I put the bit right into her mouth and then stood her up. And and my, my director, you know, got the shot of me jumping on board and, and riding off. And then he says, Oh man, I was hoping that because in reality he fought the horse, jumped up on the horse and, and, and held on the horse and then got it to calm down and tame down. But he but the, my director was looking for that scene, you know. <laughs> I was hoping I didn't have to do that scene because I don't know if you've ever tried to, to wrangle a horse, a loose horse. <laughs> it's really difficult, really, really difficult, especially if they get spooked. And, uh, you know, I didn't know the horse that well. So, but the horse went down and just like God sent it and then came back and I said, Bobby, you've just been touched by the Lord. <laughs> you were given a gift. When you see it and you play it back, people are going to wonder how in the world did you get the horse to go down like that? Right. That's a great scene. It's a great, yeah. very, very good scene. And of course, that that horse then rides with him. You know, he saved his life and he jumped. Oh, she was great. It's great. I did all my own riding. It's really wonderful. I'd right. imagine everyone did their own stunts in that film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. We didn't have any stuff. <laughs> but a lot of the writers, a lot of the people were real. You know, a lot of those. those yeah, I heard the real. judge was real. Yeah, the right? judge was a real judge of, of the court right there. That's how we got to use the court. He says, right. you know, he says I've been waiting for you guys for over, you know, uh, 50 years. Uh, 
you know, kind of in, in, here and he opened the drawer and there he had all of the transcripts and all of the trial wow. Cortez and that's what uh, we, how we wrote the story. And, uh, and he says, the only condition I have, would you please allow me to, to play the part of the judge? Because it's wow. a very important role. I said, yeah, and he goes, yeah, because it was the first time they ever had uh, interpreters in the court, federal courthouse ever in the history of the United States of America. Before that, they never had interpreters for any language. Wow. So whenever, whenever a person of whatever culture was being tried, they never knew what was happening. I didn't know that. No one did. I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah. that. Nobody knew that. And well, so, the movie is called The Battle of, of Gregorio Cortez. People, if you haven't seen it, rush out, order it, Criterion Collection. It's amazing. We're here with uh, uh, acting legend, writer, director, Mr. Edward James Almost. It's been an absolute honor, sir. It's uh, my honor. Thank you so much for the incredible uh, ability for people to understand the culture more and more. Latino slant, the only way. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, undoom. So you. say we all. So, so we say we all. <laughs> so say we all. Uh, we'll let you go, sir. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see you soon. Buena uh, suerte con todo, and uh, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks one more time. You are complete. Adios. Well, there he goes. There he is, Mr. Edward James Olmos, and. Uh, um, we're here with Undoomed and Loki. Any uh, final thoughts before we uh, uh, turn off the record? That was quite something. Huge thank you oh, yeah. to you, Polly. Huge thank yeah, you, to yes, you, my friend, thank for you. including us. Thank you for making it happen. And uh, I had a great time. It's <clears throat> amazing to hear his, his uh, explanations of all these things that you've thought about and never really thought you'd be able to ask the person in question it's it's, it's uh, the internet is truly a magical thing and you know the thing is he probably would have stayed on i mean he gave us more than 50 minutes more of what they said like he only can, can do 10 <laughs> minutes like right keep asking questions he totally could have stayed with us but you know you know i don't i didn't want to do that <laughs> i think right, he everyone. remembered you i bet he remembered you at, from from the last one um because he, oh. he, he really did seem like he remembered he said no at first but then he was like yeah, oh poly in latino's no land and <laughs> i think i think that yeah. 10 minutes is a very much a well, if you don't like them, you can just bail. You know, 10 right. minutes and you can <laughs> right, right. run, run right. for the hills. Yeah. And he stayed. That was, that was absolutely awesome. Yeah. Well, everyone, um, if you haven't, make sure you are subscribed to Undoomed and Loki. The links are in this video description. We'll see you soon, everyone. Wherever you're at, keep your slant. Muy fuerte. Gracias. Thank you to all who have donated or are going to donate. Hit the super thanks and enjoy the video.